Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. As promised, there is a brand new release in the Christian Heritage series, George Herbert's The Temple, with a fantastic foreword from John Piper. Although he was a pastor of a small, remote church in Elizabethan England, George Herbert came to fame because of a small collection of poems called The Temple. In this short but beautiful collection of poetry, Herbert devised 116 new poetic forms to capture his experience of awe, sorrow, glory, turmoil, repentance, and heart-rending joy. All of it dedicated to God, not man. In this book, we have a picture of the full range of human experience and emotion, felt by a man being sanctified by God and describing it with all his poetic powers. Get George Herbert's The Temple with a foreword from John Piper today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 133. 133. In this edition of the podcast, I, I wanted to um, take a moment to encourage all the people who listen to this thing to get involved in something if you aren't already. And if you are already involved in it, to tell you that that's the way to go, to urge you to continue. I'm talking about uh, the Bible reading challenge, the Bible reading challenge. Now, this is something that started, it's been going, um, oh, two or three years now. I've, I don't know the exact date when, we've, when it first uh, launched, but this is something that was um, the, the brainchild of my, uh, my daughter, Rachel. And so the Bible reading challenge started, and there's a, a women's Facebook group that's many thousands of women who are just simply reading the Bible together. And the idea is, you know, the Christian world has many uh, good Bible reading programs. The one hitch in them, uh, the the one uh, negative, is that these Bible reading programs generally presuppose an individualist framework. In other words, uh, I should be reading the Bible, so what's the best way for me to read the Bible? Um, so, and there are good Bible reading programs. Uh, Grant Horner's got one that's a, a good Bible reading program. Uh, Robert Murray McShane has a fam- very famous Bible reading program and so on. And you might be um, like I was for many years where I just had these um, Bible reading records and I would just check off chapters when I read them and, and then file that, that when I, you know, when I was done, when I finished them all, I, I, I would read the Bible in no particular order. Uh, but make sure that I read all the uh, all the chapters and then filed that way, filed that one away, and got a new one out. Um, since the Bible reading challenge has started, however, I've um, I think it's going I think it's going through the whole Bible maybe the, for the third time now. And uh, during the summer, they take a break. Uh, the Bible reading challenge has enlists everybody to read the same passages together, and communicate about it on Facebook or, or by other means, and there are local groups that, that, uh, where you can encourage one another and so on. Um, so um, I'm uh, doing the Bible reading challenge now, and then coming up in the summer, there'll be a same-page summer, and, and they read the, we read the New Testament over the summer all together. Now, this is the, this is the thing. Scripture says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, It doesn't say by a word or these words over here, but it's by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And one of the reasons why the church is ailing in our day, one of the reasons why the church is... um, sickly and unable to fight off infections is that we're not eating right. We're, we're not in the Word. And so uh, the, thing that, the thing that I would encourage you to think about doing 
if you're not, well, let's say if you're not reading your Bible, or if you are kind of a pokey puppy uh, as you read the Bible, you just spot read here and there, or if you have a uh, a day that's kind of a downer, you go read Psalm 23 or 1 Corinthians 13, uh, and you read the verse that the pastor is going to preach on, uh, but you're not a regular Bible reader, I would encourage you to check out the Bible reading challenge and just jump into it. As a, as a pastor and as a preacher, I can tell you that it is uh, preaching to a biblically literate people makes a huge difference. Uh, if, if a man gets up in front of a congregation and he wants to talk about Abraham, and he has to explain that Abraham lived before David did, and then he has to explain who David was, and then he has to explain, you know, the next thing and the next thing. He's, you're, you're hardly going to get to anything of practical import or importance. Uh, but if the people are just, if you're preaching to a congregation of systematic, regular, and cheerful Bible readers, you are preaching to people who are, um, who are already up to speed on many of the things that you're assuming in your message. Um, so, the Bible, re- the Bible reading challenge has had a transformational impact in the families of many. It's had a transformational impact in many churches. And if your church, or if your family, or if your household needs some, some kind of transformational impact like that, I would encourage you as, um, as a means to that end to check out the Bible Reading Challenge. Go to, uh, just Google search Bible Reading Challenge, and uh, it should pop up. It's, it's available in uh, many uh, different languages. There are groups all over the country. There are groups all over the world um, uh, doing this. and. Uh, it's not a guilt trip. It's not a self-righteousness trip. It's not a, uh, uh, we're going to send people around and bust your kneecaps if you get behind a couple of days. It doesn't work that way. Basically, the um, maxim that undergirds the uh, Bible reading challenge is any day you're reading the Bible is a good day. So if, uh, if you got busy and got behind last week, jump back in. Just jump back in where you are. Um, and you say, but I missed some stuff. Well, if you get in the habit of Bible reading, whatever you missed, you're coming back through again. You'll, you'll see this place again. Always will be Plotcast, episode 133. This is our hamartiology section. So, a hophox legemenon is a word that's used only once within a specified context. So, a hophox, and sometimes... Um, biblical scholars call it a hopox for short. I should, I should say that slowly, right? A hopox legomenon. It's a word that's used only once. Now, one such word uh, for the New Testament is asunthetos, asunthetos, and it means covenant breaker, covenant breaker. Romans one thirty one, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. With such words, it's important to draw meaning from the context. And in this case, the company that this word is keeping makes it seem pretty serious. So look at that. Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You expect all such words to be more or less in the same league. If, if Paul were writing in English and solemnly forbade murder, rape, grand larceny, walking on the grass, extortion, and violence, Somebody's going to go, huh, and investigate whether or not walking on the grass was a more serious offense than he ever thought uh, before. And sometimes he discovers that walking on the grass in the, in the original uh, Greek meant something else. Okay, that really is serious. Um, there's a passage like that in the New Testament where you've got all these horrendous sins, and then right in the middle is disobedient to parents. Disobedient to parents. Well, here, uh, covenant breakers is. Uh, fits right in with without natural affection, implacable. Covenant breaking or breaking your solemn and bonded word is a very serious thing. 
the most ex obvious example of the kind of covenant breaking that we tolerate more easily than we should, far more easily than we should, would be uh, instances of unlawful divorce. Uh, a marriage is a covenant. Um, the unfaithful wife in Proverbs is um, uh, unfaithful to the covenant. In Malachi, um, the husbands are, husbands are charged with being uh, unfaithful to their wives by covenant. And so uh, we find it easy to say, well, they just drifted apart or they grew, they, they fell out of love. Well, they took vows to cover those circumstances for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. Uh, that's why we take vows. If we knew that we were going to remain deeply, passionately in love, and we knew that, and we had assurance of that, there's no reason for the vow. Uh, we take vows because we need to. We live in a fallen world. And so covenant breaking is a, a very serious thing. For my book review uh, this time around, I'd, I'd like to um, I'd like to commend to you a book called Leftism Revisited by Kunalt Ludin, um, and I'm probably it's a it's a weird uh, Eastern European name of some sort, um, and I'm probably uh, mispronouncing it, but K U E N E H T dash L E D D I H N, Kunalt Ludin. So Leftism Revisited. This um, Here's the deal. This is what we're up against. I would encourage uh, thinking Christians to look at the political landscape and uh, and look at the fact that Bernie Sanders, an avowed socialist, remember math is hard. You know, <laughs> math is hard. Uh, an avowed socialist uh, looks like he's in a very strong position to win the Democratic nomination for the president of the United States. And he's an elderly gent, um, and he appears to believe all this stuff. But his support is coming from young people. Uh, the energy, the support, the affection, the love is coming from young people. And this, what this tells me is that we have done a bad, bad, bad job educating our young people they don't know that this free stuff thing doesn't work. They don't know that it ends in breadlines. They don't know that it ends in famines. They don't know that, it, that socialism is the great destroyer. Socialism is a pollyon. Now, in 1950, for example, the, the wealthiest city in, in 1950, the wealthiest city in North America was Detroit, and the wealthiest city in South America, or Latin America, was Havana. Now, look at where those cities are now, and you see what collectivism does, every form of collective. It's just a great poverty-generating machine. Uh, and one of the things that we need to do is, before we can educate young people on these things, we have to educate ourselves. And so I'm, uh, I would encourage uh, conservative Christians to to consider some of the consider reading over the next year or two consider reading some of the classic some of the great conservative classics some of the um, some books that are just um, that 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 we need to be reminded of the truth of uh, I would include in this um, Whitaker Chambers book uh, Witness. Uh, I would include uh, this one that I'm commending to you now, Leftism Revisited. It's a, um, a very good treatment of the, of the hist history, basically uh, a history and interaction with uh, leftist uh, political thought. Um, we need to be acquainted with this sort of thing. We need to know how to give answers. Um, and it's th this is the kind of book which, um, when you read, you will... <laughs> You're likely to say, I didn't know, I didn't know. Uh, and, and it'll get you um, churned up and, and ready for the fray. Uh, and that fray is coming.